thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, thanks to the organisers for the invitation. You can see the cover of uh, the book that I wrote with some colleagues, What's Wrong with Anzac? That came out in 2010, uh, so it's now four years old, but of course everything we wrote about then um, has simply been exacerbated uh, as the years have gone on until next year when we have the big one, the centenary of the Gallipoli landing. We wrote the book then because we'd noticed in the previous 10 or 15 years a relentless militarisation of Australian history. And that was sort of one of our focuses, the way that Australian history had been completely rewritten and rewritten largely by the educational agents of DVA, the Department of Veterans Affairs. And we thought it was a really peculiar thing that a federal government department set up ostensibly to take care of veterans and graves of veterans overseas and their families. In fact, since 1995, the late 1990s, had spent increasing millions of dollars of resources on pedagogical matters, on creating a new curriculum for primary and secondary schools, which they had sent out to you know, every school in the country throughout the year. This wasn't just about Gallipoli, but part of the campaign, part of the creation of public memory, as it were, was to figure out a whole variety of strategies that you would create a a sort of new refurbished public memory and one of those and they listed these quite explicitly these were listed quite explicitly in DVA materials um, and one of them was to identify a whole range of days throughout the year new days you know like the bombing of Darwin Day um, that could be used again and again and again to um, commemorate some aspect of military history. I urge you to buy What's Wrong with Anzac, not simply because I was one of the authors, but chapter six, I think, we have a very detailed research-based uh, chapter outlining all of the money and all of the campaigns um, that came out of DBA um, that went into schools. And so any person sort of here in the audience who's under about 40, under 35, would have been subjected to this new education, which I think young people now take for granted. They take for granted that that's what they learn in schools. Um, I was astonished, for example, um, two or three years ago, you know, because there are now all sorts of pilgrimages all the time to Gallipoli and from Mel and all of the battlefields that school children often win prizes to do or their finance to go on. And I was astonished at one report in The Age that had a young man of about 20 um, from Victoria and he was asked why he was there at Gallipoli. And he said, I, I came here because this is where Australian history began. He said, nothing happened before then. And I thought, what? <laughs> this was qu quite disturbing. Um, and so one of the other things we wanted to emphasise in our book is how this emphas emphasis on military values, military traditions, the military founding of the nation, um, was at the expense of, ironically, a proud tradition that Australians once shared of political and civil achievements. Um, you know, Australia, the Australian colonies and the federal commonwealth um, were the first in the world at many, many social democratic achievements. Um, you know, payment to members of parliament, the eight hour day, the first legal minimum wage in the world, uh, the first full political rights to women, uh, the, you, you know, arbitration and the living wage. The, the first old age and invalid pensions found um, paid out of general revenue. These, you could, there's a long list of these things. And at the time, before World War I, these were the, the glory days before World War I, this is what Australia was known for around the world. So it's a complete travesty then, <laughs> you know, to sort of name this sort of military tradition, these military achievements as definitive of our national values and of who we are. So that was also, as historians we wrote, in a way to suggest that there were um, other narratives that we should know about. This is wonderful Loini cartoon, which picked up on our subtitle. The subtitle of our book is The Militarisation of Australian History. Well, this cartoon is the militarisation of everyday life. And I was just delighted when I saw it because he picked up on the fact that, you know, Operation Sovereign Borders, Operation Bring Them Home, that so many aspects of our daily life now are militarised I mean, in a quite peculiar way. So he there has Operation Clean Sweep, Operation Black Fang, 
Operation Iron Resolve, Operation Golden Splurge, Operation Hellfire and Operation Dark Hole, of course, at the end. I was really quite astonished to see this is just this year because it showed the logic of the militarisation. We, we'd, we'd defined it, we'd find, identified it in the writing of history. What Leunig had picked up on was the sort of militarisation of everyday life. This is a sort of travesty, not least because the radical liberals who founded the Commonwealth of Australia one of the things, by the way, I was very impressed with Adam Bant in Melbourne at a rally against the budget not long ago. He made the point, and I was really pleased because it showed some rare liter historical literacy amongst um, politicians. He, he made the point about the significance of the term Commonwealth, the Commonwealth of Australia. It's a really, really significant term that was much debated, much fought over. There was a big um, a, a vote on it in the federal conventions because a lot of people, of course, thought the term Commonwealth was too Republican, too subversive, not British enough, and they won the vote. And the Commonwealth of Australia was sentimentally popular because, of course, it, it indicated a sense of the common wheel, of, the common, of, of, of a shared distribution that was actually quite explicitly articulated in those years, 1902, 1903. Um, H.B. Higgins, one of our noble founding fathers, the radical liberal intellectual who was the first uh, to hand down the living wage, Higgins wrote a very interesting article in 1902 called Australian Ideals. I mean, what an interesting idea, Australian Ideals. In that essay, he said, and he was really prescient about the fact, that if Australians didn't have a say over what wars we fought in and how we fought them and how they would end, as was happening in the Boer War, he said, you know, this would be a terrible precedent, as it turned out to be, for Australia and, a, and a, you know, a terrible sign of our dependence. And he wrote this essay called Australian Ideals and he said, Australians will have to choose, he said, between the ideal of equality and the ideal of militarism. Isn't that interesting? The ideal of equality and the ideal of militarism. He juxtaposed these two things, not the more stereotypical, you know, peace and militarism or equality and militarism, because what he said was that equality, the ideal of equality, you know, obviously not the reality, the ideal of equality was essential to the sense of who Australians were and, and what, what we should pursue. And that militarism, he said, would undermine this. Um, and I, th I kept thinking of that this year because of the juxtaposition of the increasing militarisation of our culture, Operation Sovereign Borders, is a really good example, with the budget. I mean, the budget which enshrined, as everybody just about has seen, inequalities. You know, that, that here juxtaposed exactly well, the two things that Higgins had said, the ideal of equality, the ideal of militarism. So here we had militarism triumphing in Australia at the expense of the ideal of equality. And the, the fact that those two things were so explicitly evident this year, 1914, 100 years after the outbreak of World War I, um, I thought was quite amazing. The final point about the logic of militarisation, the militarisation of Australian history, the militarisation of everyday life. And of course, you know, since I was invited to speak here, we're at war, it seems, again. There's a sort of logic of militarisation. And the logic of militarisation is that there must be an enemy. If it were the case, as Abbott sometimes pretends, you know, oh no, we're not targeting Muslims, we're targeting crime. I mean, if that were really the case, that would not have that logic of an enemy. But militarisation has the logic of an enemy. And so militarisation needs an enemy. It needs a national enemy. And that's what people can see. They can see that readily enough, that of course, the logic of militarisation, the logic of going to war, needs an enemy, creates an enemy. And just like World War I and Vietnam, it, it will create an enemy at home. I mean, that's how these things work. That's how the logic of militarisation works. And as we know, World War I and Vietnam were really, really divisive wars. And in part because of that way that the militarisation, the going to war, the declaration of war, relentlessly creates and vilifies enemies at home. So I think that we all should return 
to Higgins's vision that Australians have to choose between the ideals of equality and the ideal of militarism. And I think we should reject militarism overwhelming. Thank you. The Australian colonies and then the new Commonwealth of Australia from 1901 established a reputation in the world, a high profile in the world, for advanced state socialism, to use the term then, for advanced democratic reform. The reforms that they uh, pioneered included the eight hour day, the first legal minimum wage in the world, which was legislated in Victoria in 1896. Then the definition of a legal minimum wage as a living wage, which paid heed of people's needs, not of employers' desire for profits. That was an Australian first. Australia was the first country in the world to give full political rights to women. That is the right not just to vote, but for stand for parliament. Australia was the first country in the world to legislate for old age and invalid pensions paid out of general revenue, not based on insurance, the idea that you have to put in before you get out. Australia had the first maternity allowance in the world, which extended to unmarried mothers, which was very radical. And again, it was based on general revenue that you didn't have to put in before you got out. And, and so the list could go on. And people overseas, particularly in English speaking countries, but also in Germany and France, and China knew about. This is Australia was famous for this. So people flocked here to see the experiments for themselves. Um, they came to interview some of the pioneers like H.B. Higgins. They, Vida Goldstein took the message to the United States. There was a real international trade in ideas. Um, Chinese reformers before the revolution came to see this new modern democratic nation state because they were planning their own revolution. So Australia was seen as a model in all these sorts of democratic reforms. It was very independent minded despite the fact that it was still part of the British Empire, that when war was declared in 1914, Australians were obliged to follow. But Australia had power over conscription, over how men would be raised for the army. And this meant that Australia effectively had quite a power in shaping its foreign policy, if you see what I mean. They could decide, and they did by referendum, that they were not going to have conscription, and they twice defeated it. Now, this was really frustrating for Prime Minister W.M. Hughes, and he was English-born, by the way, and um, the British government, because Australians had the power domestically, and women voted too, by the way, to say, no, we're not going to let all of our men be conscripted. So there's a whole sort of record of independent, radical action, mobilisation, political and civil society that all gets shut down by World War I. The significance of World War I is it sees Australia locked back into an imperial embrace in the 1920s and 30s. Britishness becomes important, loyalty becomes important, loyalty to Britain in a way it never was before. Um, so World War I has a very reactionary um, effect on Australian society and Australian politics.